All right, uh, welcome everyone and thanks for joining us. I'm Amanda Williams and joining me is Jim Zobel and we are both historians here at the MacArthur Memorial in Norfolk, Virginia. Now, inter-service rivalry between the US Navy and the US Army was a major factor in the Pacific theater during World War II. While such rivalry is common in all militaries because each service has to compete for funding and it has to stake out a unique identity and a mission to justify that funding, some scholars argue that in the case of the Pacific War, um, the rivalry was so problematic that it led to inefficiencies in the conduct of the war in that theater. And they attribute this rivalry to obviously the interests of the individual services, but also to personality problems between the senior leaders out there. Um, MacArthur stands out as one of the key personalities that played a role in this rivalry. And today we're going to talk about a few questions. What exactly was his relationship like with the U.S. Navy during World War II? Was there an anti-MacArthur cabal at work, as he seemed to feel at times? And did his personality alienate his counterparts? Um, and was he the reason for divided command in the Pacific? So th those are the questions we're going to try to talk about today. So Jim, start us off. Sometimes people talk about MacArthur like he was just born with an innate dislike of the Navy. Um, that seems a little dramatic and doesn't seem entirely supported by sources, but what do we know about his early view and relationship with the Navy prior to World War II? Funny, in uh, reminiscences, you know, he says in there, there's no inner service rivalry. There never has been, you know, this is all a bunch of talk that's been put around, but in, uh, it's funny because in June of 1942, uh, when they were having the Guadalcanal, Papua New Guinea, and they were looking, you know, as what they were going to do in the future coming up, MacArthur writes to George C. Marshall and says, I discovered a plot in the 1930s where the Navy is trying to take us over, you know? And so it's, uh, he had kind of forgotten about that part. But of course, yeah, his, his brother, Arthur, goes to Annapolis and graduates in, in 1896. He fights in those sea battles with Spain uh, right off Cuba in 1898. He's out in the Pacific serving in the fleet uh, during the Boxer Rebellion time when his father is there in the Philippines. He'll go on to uh, be one of the first submarine captains the United States ever has. He'll marry the daughter of, of Bowman McCalla, one of the great admirals of the turn of the century and Douglas MacArthur will remark about how when they lived out in the Presidio in San Francisco and his father was command out there in 03 they would have these family gatherings where Arthur MacArthur and Bowman McCallo would be sitting there talking about all their experiences and I, I think MacArthur just loves fighters and and that's what you'll see uh throughout World War II, you know, uh, D Douglas MacArthur's nephew, his brother Arthur's son, he'll go to the Naval Academy as well. He dies there as a young midshipman, you know, um, and the superintendent at that time is, is uh, Admiral Thomas Hart, which will be a big factor later on. We don't really know uh, how MacArthur acted. That's when he's chief of staff, you know, is when his nephew Malcolm dies at the Academy. So we don't you know, was, was there any kind of, you know, talk going on between him and Hart at that time? We really don't know. But during the 1930s, when MacArthur's chief of staff, there's a lot of um, worry about coastal reconnaissance, who has control of aerial defenses of the, of the coasts. And MacArthur and, and Admiral Pratt, who's the chief of naval operations at that time, they worked that out almost on a handshake deal. You know, they, they establish, okay, we're going to do this and you do that. And it really sets it up for what becomes the formality later on. So MacArthur's not really, um, there's no really antagonism that's expressed a great deal. You know, he, he hasn't had much dealing with the Navy uh, except for, um, you know, with this coastal defense problem um, during the their 1930s. Uh, but everything will, will definitely come to a head in uh 
in World War II, you know, about how they all feel each other. There'll be a lot of things said, um, but MacArthur and, and Nimitz and Halsey and these guys will, will work it out. I mean, there'll be a lot of, of, of give and take and a lot of um, pushing um, by both sides, uh, but they will, as you see, as the war progresses um, from, you know, those early days of Guadalcanal, Papua New Guinea, up through Cartwheel, up through Reno 4 into the Philippines, that, that they, they always iron it out. You know, when you're getting to the end of the war, you are very glad that it ends when it does, because you're not sure what have hap would have happened between them as time progressed. Mm. All right. So when World War II begins, MacArthur is the Army commander in the Philippines, and Admiral Thomas Hart, who we've already brought up, he is leading the Asiatic fleet from the Philippines. Can you tell us about their working relationship in the early days of World War II, and how does this cover the or how does this um, color the Navy's perspective of who MacArthur is, and vice versa? Right. Well, Tommy Hart had been one of Arthur MacArthur's best friends. You know, MacArthur's brother. They graduated at the same time. He's a pallbearer at Arthur MacArthur's funeral. Uh, so we know that these guys know each other. When Thomas Hart comes out there to be Asiatic Fleet Commander, MacArthur is the military advisor to the Philippines. He's not, you know, in control of any U.S. forces or anything like that. And he's kind of been pushed to the side, ignored, you know, because he's been retired since about 1937. And that comes, uh, like, William White uh, was a a journalist. His son was the guy who wrote They Were Expendable about the PT boat escape from the Philippines later on. But William White comes out there in the 1930s. He's very much worried about the Japanese moves um, that are going on in China and everywhere else. And when he goes to see Gruner, who's head of the Philippine Department, which is the U.S. Army, you know, position out there, uh, Gruner's like, don't bother going to see MacArthur. There's no reason to, you know, go see him. And that kind of shows the way they were they were looking at him. Um, and that even goes with Hart. Hart lives there in the Manila Hotel. Um, I, I, there's not a lot said about how they first interacted with each other. But once MacArthur is called back to the colors in 1941, uh, Hart starts thinking it's getting really weird. Um, they'll have a lot of inter-service rivalry over about that same coastal defense, you know, who has air control over certain areas. Uh, they'll have a lot of fights over shore patrols, um, maneuvers against army soldiers in China, um, just, you know, petty kind of things. And then, you know, things that really do matter. Uh, but MacArthur as well, you know, when they live in the same place and, and, and MacArthur will be like, hey, Tommy, come down and let's talk about this. And he'll come down there and MacArthur will be in his underwear, you know, with like a, a kimono on, eating a, a head of lettuce, you know, or, or cabbage. And you don't meet too many people that are doing that. And it kind of just, you know, sticks into Tommy Hart, you know, what is going on here? They start talking about, you know, what could be coming up in, in the war here. And, and Hart will say that MacArthur knows a lot of things that just aren't so. You know, he's, he, he knows a great deal of things that just aren't real. And then he'll even say that, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't think Douglas MacArthur's sane or has been for quite some time. And this has a lot to do with um, as things are progressing towards that war, because when MacArthur's making plans for like Rainbow Five and uh, and wanting to defend on the beaches instead of uh, going back to uh, Batan Corregidor and War Plan Orange, um, Tommy Hart is, you know, also working on, you know, getting ready for the war. And MacArthur will say, well, the Army has its plans and the Navy has its plans. So they're not there's not a lot of things that are in concert between these, these two people. Uh, MacArthur does not see Hart as a fighter uh, at all. Um, and whereas in like November of, of 41, there's a meeting between Sayer, who's the State Department rep, he's the high commissioner uh, out there, and uh, Tommy Hart's there and MacArthur's there. And MacArthur's very much anticipating what's coming. You know, he keeps saying it's going to be April, but he says he'll be ready. Hart is just kind of 
is is now being drawn into this and and he's so enthused by macarthur's enthusiasm even even though he thinks he's you know out there that he starts saying maybe we should keep the asiatic fleet here bolster it up and get ready to defend the philippines whereas the navy's like no that's not going to happen um and the fleet will will position itself to the south before the japanese attack uh once the war starts uh, hart immediately starts stockpiling corregidor with food and MacArthur's looking towards defending on the beaches. Um, so Hart, I think, has a little bit more of a realistic approach as to what's coming. Um, but the thing is, is they don't work. They're not telling each other a lot. I mean, Hart does get uh, ultra intelligence, the diplomatic from the purple machine that the Navy has. But there's, and he's passing that on to MacArthur, but there's not a lot of great deal of, of working together. And MacArthur is totally disgusted when, the Japanese invasion fleet comes and none of Hart's submarines can do anything because that's really the only people that are still left in the Philippines is that motor torpedo boat squadron and then the the submarines that are still there, those old S type submarines. The rest of the fleet is pulled out down to the the south and Java and the um, Australian Dutch British American uh, naval command, and those submarines can't do anything because that that's the problem with those torpedoes in the Mark IVs. Um, the detonators don't work. They don't figure that out till like late September. But uh, the submarines have no effect on the Japanese invasion fleet that comes in. And MacArthur just you can't can't understand that at all. And then when they go to leave for Corregidor and they declare an open city, he doesn't even tell Hart that they're doing that. Wow. Yeah. And so then Hart, you know, meets him on the the docks as they're going to Corregidor and says, you know, why didn't you even tell me that? And they have this like meeting right there, and nobody really knows what they said. But Hart will leave that night and he'll go down south and then he'll finally get back to Washington, you know, about the time when MacArthur's being pulled out to Australia and he's going to tell Admiral King all these things. And that's going to color Admiral King's viewpoint of MacArthur throughout the war pretty much. I mean, the only people he hates more than MacArthur maybe are the British. And as the war comes to a close and the, the British are starting to get into the Pacific, that's what draws MacArthur and King back together because they both don't want the British there. And so Washington will always have this viewpoint of, of that's what, you know, that, and that's why it'll be divided command and all that, you know, because, because King will never uh, trust MacArthur and won't want to give him control of anything. And so it'll be a divided you know, command by that. So yeah, those early days definitely color um, the way that a lot of the brass will think about MacArthur. It'll color the way they tell their commanders about him. But as the war goes through the, like Halsey, like in Nimitz, I said, you know, they'll find out that MacArthur can be pretty erratic, but he can be very reasonable. And, mm -hmm. you know, when, when they get together, MacArthur's always the gentleman, Nimitz is always the gentleman. So it's, it's a confusing state. Um, but they're more in line with each other than, than the Japanese are, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. it, it seems that that whole, all those difficulties in, you know, late 1941, early 42 in the Philippines with that essentially divided command in the Philippines would have been a great argument later on in the war for, we need a unified command, but I yeah. guess it's not. It, it turns into the exact opposite argument. Well, that's, the, you know, that's what makes, as we were talking about last, last time that's what makes kruger you know so important to all this because he is able to bring all those factions together during operational planning mm -hmm. um he's a big believer in combined operations that you know macarthur will will be swung to that i mean because the thing is when he you know when macarthur gets to australia he has a total bitter uh taste in his mouth you know for for the navy except for john buckley and the torpedo guys who he thinks are you right. know, brilliant masters of the sea they're fighters. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and but when he gets there, he'll he'll just be, you know, have this have this coloring against the Navy that that won't work itself out really until Halsey comes, until Halsey comes. And then the, the, those guys will will finally get get over that, you know, part that divides everything. MacArthur gets to Australia in March 1942. And then in April, the Pacific is divided up into essentially four different areas. 
Um, you've got the Southwest Pacific area, which is going to be MacArthur's command. And then you've got the different Pacific Ocean areas, the North, Central, and South, that are basically under the command of Admiral Chester Nimitz. Now, why was the theater divided up like this? Um, it seems, and I mean, you've already covered it a little bit, but it seems that there was a lot of political support and public support for MacArthur to assume total command of the entire theater. So how, yeah. how you've gotten into it a little bit, but elaborate a little more. Well, there's, there's you know, Macar MacArthur, when he gets to Australia, he, he's big hero. I mean, around the world, you know, he's the, the rallying point, the only one that the, the command was still fighting in the Philippines. And there's a lot of people wanting to bring him home to be, you know, commander of the entire war effort. Uh, for the United States. And so there are a lot of people pushing for him as well in the Pacific, you know, and, and Roosevelt would, would say that he couldn't, you know, wasn't going to get rid of him. You know, he affects MacArthur's ability and, and that's well known. But, you know, there's also that side of, I don't want to deal with him. Uh, but he feels that, that MacArthur has so much Republican support within the Congress and the Senate that, you know, he can't, he can't, get rid of him. Uh, now, the Navy has been getting ready for this their entire history, you know, this this war, all-out naval war with, with Japan. And King thinks, that you know, or says this is a Navy theater, this is going to be a Navy war. I mean, MacArthur gets to Australia and immediately, you know, you're separated from the Philippines by about 3,000 miles of water. And the only way you're going to get anywhere is by ships, you know, and he's got this problem with the Navy, but, you know, he's going to, he's, he knows that that's the way that they're going to get back anywhere is, is you know, with, with the Navy. Um, so I think also that, that Marshall is very instrumental in getting MacArthur that theater, you know, the Southwest Pacific area. Um, MacArthur will always be suspicious of Marshall. But as you and I have said, we, you know, Marshall is probably the best friend he has back in Washington. Um, and that ensures that, that he'll get control of that Southwest Pacific area. But yes, there is a lot of pressure to give him control of everything, but that's not going to happen, you know, with the, with the Navy in, in control. Um, they separate the theaters in April. Um, MacArthur, uh, the thing is, is right after uh, Coral Sea, Midway. Uh, MacArthur will say immediately say, give me aircraft carriers and a Marine division and I'll take Rabaul, you know, the big Japanese base, 100,000 troops, five airfields, the biggest harbor in the Pacific. And King's like, are you a lunatic? You know, you're going to have to go step by step to go back there. You can't just go, you know, straight up there. We'll get everything destroyed. And, and MacArthur will come back. Well, I wasn't talking about going there immediately. You know, I'm talking about going step by step. And so they'll, they'll, come back and, and come back with the task one, two, three plans, which will take them into Guadalcanal and Papua New Guinea. Because see, it really is Admiral King that gets them out of that strategic defensive because uh, of Coral Sea Midway. They know they need to go on the, uh, you know, a limited offensive to, to make moves against the Japanese while they're off balance. And, and so King is the one that really, you know, pushes the war. MacArthur understands that um, and will say so later on. Um, but in those in those early days, it it's setting up those commands in those different theaters. There's there's still a lot of, of friction uh, between everybody. But yeah, I, I believe it is a lot of politics that are in it. Um, but it's also the the army wants to have its place in the Pacific War, and and Marshall knows that, and MacArthur's his guy. You know, he's gonna you know they don't have a great personal relationship, but that's the guy he's gonna task with with the Pacific. The Navy won't let MacArthur have any carriers, and they don't want him to directly command any naval forces <laughs> at all. Um, so when you hear the term MacArthur's Navy in the context of the Pacific War, what does that mean? Well, when he arrives in Australia, there are, you know, Australian destroyers, there are Australian cruisers, as like some um, New Zealander ships, you know, maybe a, you know, a Dutch ship or so. Um, but then MacArthur will get destroyers and, and, you know, light cruisers later on. And that will be what's called Seventh Fleet. And MacArthur does have command of that. Um, Herbert Leary will be there at the beginning 
the thing is, MacArthur has no naval liaison officer on his staff. And, you know, the, the only way they could get to talk to each other is when Leary goes to see him. But the thing is, is Leary is, is talking directly with Admiral King and Admiral Nimitz and not routing those conversations through Douglas MacArthur, who is his superior. So he'll be gone by October of 1942. Uh, they bring in Arthur Carpenter um, and he's MacArthur sees him as very wary of putting ships in danger. Now, during that Guadalcanal period, pretty much uh, all that naval support that MacArthur has, the Seventh Fleet, is going to be siphoned off to that Guadalcanal campaign just because the, the Japanese are going full force with the Tokyo Express, with all those uh, Iron Bottom Sound battles that are going on as well. MacArthur will be giving a great deal of his airplanes, submarines, all that. And so there will always, and that's what I mean, MacArthur may gripe about it, but he always cooperates. You know, he says, okay, you can have it. And later on when they'll say you're, you're not cooperating, he'll say, I've given them everything I got. You know, what, do you, what else do you expect me to do? And so there's, there's a lot of that where they're trying to um, work that out. But eventually Seventh Fleet will build upon itself. And then after January of 1943, they'll create Seventh Amphibious Corps as well, which will be all those ships that will work all those invasions. And, you know, the thing is, is that um, the Japanese Navy throughout the war is most worried about MacArthur's theater because they don't know how to deal with it because he really has no Navy. I mean, they, they know how they can, how they have to deal with Nimitz and the Pacific Fleet, but MacArthur is just totally perplexing to them because he, he keeps moving forward, you know, and, and they see him as, you know, they, they have no ability to, to stop it because they have no fleet <laughs> they have to go after because it is just a lot of, you know, very uh, small ships, but they'll continually build on. Um, Seventh Fleet will come under Kincaid in November of 1943. Thomas Kincaid, he'd been up and uh, done all that work with the Aleutian campaigns. And um, these guys are professionals and, you know, they, they work it out. But yeah, MacArthur will have Seventh Fleet. They'll never get like battleships or, or anything like that. But, um, but they'll, they'll, you know, they'll be a force that, that MacArthur works with throughout, throughout the campaigns. So yeah, Seventh Fleet is his, his Navy to say. Does Halsey change anything about the way MacArthur sees the Navy during the war and vice versa? I think Halsey changes the way a lot of the Navy sees MacArthur. Um, you know, they, he had been filled with what you're going to find out with this guy. You're going to go there. You know, you're not going to get a word in edgewise. He's going to dominate everything. And... In April of 1943, because in January they had that uh, Casablanca conference and they were going to start uh, the drive through the Solomon Islands and up the coast of New Guinea. And so MacArthur and Halsey are going to work together uh, with what MacArthur called Elkton, but will eventually become Cartwheel. And so in April of 43, Halsey goes to see MacArthur. And right before he gets there, MacArthur puts out this uh, statement that says, navies can't control anything anymore. It's all air power. You know, basically saying the Navy can't do anything. And Halsey ignores it, you know, and he gets there. And Halsey said five minutes after he was there, he felt like they had been best friends their entire life. MacArthur likes him immediately. You know, he remembers, you know, the first thing is like, you were the football player, you know, and MacArthur loves football. And he was the fullback at Navy. And, uh, and MacArthur will be the only one throughout the war that will actually call him Bull. Halsey because it's not really a you know a, a name that that Halsey likes very much but he likes it when MacArthur calls him that uh these guys reckon you know and, and MacArthur will say sailors will follow that guy anywhere you know and and Halsey is is Mr. Four-Letter Word you know if there's not a four-letter word in the sentence it's not really a sentence Whereas MacArthur said, or Halsey said that MacArthur would never use a curse word because it would ruin the eloquence of his diction, you know. And Halsey, even though he's, you know, he's junior to MacArthur, but he says MacArthur never orders him to do anything. He'll push him. He'll push him. You know, they'll have meetings for four days in a row where MacArthur's like, you need to do this. You need to do this. You need to do this. And Halsey would say, nope. And then MacArthur would be like, all right, well, that's it. You know, you do it the way you want it. 
And so they do work together well. And I think that that helps a lot with that, that MacArthur Navy inter service rivalry. You know, um, MacArthur will see him as a comrade. They'll be best friends till the end of their lives. Uh, you know, if, if, you know, people say MacArthur doesn't really have a lot of friends, but Halsey is one. Right after Inchon, Halsey writes him, you know, wow, that was the greatest thing ever. I wish I could have been there, you know? And, uh, so, and even after Leyte Golf, you know, with, with all the, you know, things where Halsey, you know, people have always said he messes up, you know, all the staff is there saying, you know, Halsey screwed up, Halsey, what a jerk, you know, blah, blah, blah. And MacArthur slams on the table, you know, I'm not going to hear any more of this about Bull Halsey. He's a fighting admiral in my book and always will be, you know. So I think that, that you know, in the sense of that inner service rivalry, I don't think anything will ever cure the air chief, George Kinney, or uh, Richard Sutherland, the chief of staff, of their, you know, hatred of the Navy. But I, I think, you know, Mac MacArthur really sincerely likes Halsey and respects him. And I think that'll help a lot when he finally has to get together with Nimitz, you know, um, come, come March of 1944. What about MacArthur's relationship with Admiral Kincaid and Admiral Barbie? Totally professional. You know, okay. totally, um, nothing friendly. And even Barbie will say that. There's no warmth in the man, you know, talking about MacArthur, saying... All he is is military. Every discussion is military. There's never small talk, you know, um, but he says that he's the best boss he ever had um, because uh, MacArthur tells Barbie, you're here to get me back to the Philippines. That's your job. You do what you need to do. If you got any problems, you come to me. Otherwise, you take care of it. And MacArthur won't tell Barbie whatever to do because he thinks he's a genius at, you know, amphibious operations which he really is i mean you give barbie a surfboard you're going to do a amphibious operation same with kincaid kincaid will come in there um in in november of 43 macarthur had, had problems with the earlier ones uh kincaid's getting a little bigger fleet and the thing is the first big operation that can with the marines and MacArthur will save the Marines. You know, I, I know what you guys think of me, but I know that when you need something done, the Marines are the people you turn to. And when Kincaid comes in, the, the Army groups that were being in all these amphibious operations really had a problem with George Kinney's air cover because the Navy's always used to having continual air cover all the time over the fleet, whereas Kinney's thing was like, I got to destroy all the airfields and that'll take care of all the airplanes going after the amphibious runs, which is there is some truth to it. But when uh, they have these staff meetings, you know, and Kruger has put together all the operational things, but one of the last sticking points is this air cover and MacArthur will side with Barbie and Kincaid in the Navy, you know, over, over Kinney. Um, and, and he'll do that, uh, throughout, you know, so he, it's that Kincaid will say of, that every of one of those army officers is a horse thief and a liar, <laughs> and <everything laughs> else. um, but he's able to work it, you know, he's a professional and, um, and McCart he's really the only guy that can say no to MacArthur and not flinch. You know, when they get there to the Philippines and MacArthur's wanting to push that Mindoro invasion and Kincaid's just like, nope, not ready. Not going to happen for a week and a half. And MacArthur does that push, push, push thing like he did with Halsey. And finally, one day he's like, I'm mad as hell at you, but I still love you, Tommy. You know, you're, you do it the way you got to do it, you know, and, and they, they push it off. So um, it's like Barbie says, you know, MacArthur's not really a guy you're going to be friends with. That's why Eichelberger doesn't ever work out because he just wants to talk all the time. And MacArthur was like, I'm, I might make him my chief of staff, but I just want, don't want to sit there and talk, you know, about things that don't really matter. Um, and so that's the way uh, these guys see him. It's all professional and um, we can work, we can work it out and they do work it out. Now, a big criticism of the Pacific Theater is that you do have these divided commands competing with each other for resources instead of one unified joint command. 
While MacArthur and Nimitz's drives through the Pacific um, in their respective areas tend to complement each other um, and were basically designed to do that, MacArthur and Nimitz have completely different ideas about the overall strategy of kind of the end of the war. What do we know about their relationship and how does this impact the war? MacArthur has the, the idea that you get to Japan by going the New Guinea, Philippines, uh, Japan access, and you always have land-based air cover covering everything. Um, Nimitz is more of the, the Central Pacific drive, straight, straight attack at the heart of Japan. There is that divided command, you know, mainly because of, of Admiral King. You know, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't want um, MacArthur to have control of any of that. Um, the thing is, and there have been a lot of people that said that MacArthur's uh, campaigns weren't necessary. You know, they should have just done everything through the, the Central Pacific. But the amount of soldiers, troops that are sucked off to MacArthur's theater, the amount of airplanes that are sucked off to MacArthur's theater and then thoroughly and completely destroyed, um, those all would have been used against the Navy. You know, and, and w if they didn't have to worry about New Guinea and all that, would have there have been so much more at Kwajalein or Tarawa or, or all those places that were, you know, serious bloodbaths. The thing where it really works is during that Biok Marianas operation, because uh, after Admiral Koga is killed in the plane crash in June, so he won't. Toyota takes over, and he was going to do a, a battleship run at the invasion fleet at Biak uh, when MacArthur goes in there in, in late May, early June. But as they're getting ready to pull this thing off, um, then the, the drive comes into the Marianas, and that draws the Japanese Navy up there where they'll get into the Marianas turkey shoot and get get all those pilots wiped out. So in that sense, it is a compliment because the, like a, you know, the, the Japanese are off balance when these guys are coming across. And like we said before, the Japanese have, Navy has no idea what to do with, with MacArthur at all. So they have different viewpoints, but when the first time that MacArthur will need those aircraft carriers for an invasion is Hollandia. And that's the big operation where they do the 580 mile leap. And because they go so far, they really don't have that land-based, you know, air cover that can be there all the time. Kinney had said he would take out the, the land-based, you know, air power, but uh, uh, Nimitz is going to provide those aircraft carriers. And when they go to meet in Australia and Brisbane of March of 44, everything's total cordial. Uh, Nimitz and MacArthur are, when they're with each other, they are always gentlemen. Um, there's never any rancor, you know, they, that doesn't take any part in, in it. The staff will have some problems, but those two, no. Um, and the thing is, is, you know, they'll say things in the background about each other. You know, there's been a few recorded things where I, I think um, Nimitz had a picture of MacArthur on his desk and, you know, told someone one time, whenever I think about talking to the press, I just look at this picture and then I don't talk to the press. And supposedly MacArthur would always refer to Admiral as Admiral Nimitz, you know, every time he talked about, well, I wonder what Nimitz is going to do. So there are those things, but they do iron it out, you know, especially when you get to that, um, the Formosa Philippines, um, you know, which I think is coming up, you know, um, that they are, they do show their professional gentlemanly qualities. Now, the thing is, is, you know, throughout the war, they're always like, why don't you go have these planning conferences with Nimitz? You know, Marshall is saying that. And, it, and the, early in the war, Marshall says, I'll come out there and take you over to him. And MacArthur's like, I'm not going to have you hold my hand while I go to <laughs> meet this guy. Is it just, like, he just right. says, no, I'm not going over there. If you want to meet, come over here. And that's the way he is pretty much throughout the war. But whenever the people show up, they're like, oh gosh, we gotta go see him. Then he's like totally cordial, throws him off balance, you know, you know, makes it, you know, like with the Halsey thing, they've been friends the whole time. In the later in the war, uh, when they're planning for the invasion of Japan, 
they're saying, why don't you take your headquarters and position it on Guam right next to Admiral Nimitz's? And MacArthur's like, no way, I'm not doing that. You know, I'm not going there. And then Nimitz flies into Luzon. And MacArthur meets him at the airport. Nimitz thinks he's staying at some Navy barracks. MacArthur's like, nope, you're coming. You're staying in the house with me. We're going to sit there and work this out together. You know, to he's always so much different from the radio traffic. MacArthur, that is. He's the stickler. Every point is, you know, contested. He's suspicious <laughs> of everything that's said. But yet when you get around him, it's all great you know there's no and it's almost like as soon as Nimitz flies away from Luzon on the, that last you know big meeting MacArthur's back at it again you know the, <laughs> in the message traffic so Nimitz is is I think understands that you know he can he can work with him you know he may not be like with the other guys you know I'm not his best friend you know but but we can work this out and and that's shown especially at that uh at that Pearl Harbor, you know, conference, which we'll get to, I think. At the end of his life, um, in like 1961, they were, or 60, they invited MacArthur to come to this dinner for Nimitz. Um, and MacArthur was very sick at the, at that, at that point, you know, he won't die until four years later, but he had a lot of problems in 60. And he'll write to the people and say, no finer admiral has ever been produced in the history of the world, you know? And so, you have all those problems, mm. um, but MacArthur recognizes right. it for what it is, you know, and, and it, when, when Nimitz, and th that's the thing about Nimitz and Halsey. I think that, that after 35, when MacArthur's mom dies, when he goes to the Philippines, Pershing's out of the army, all these people that were his superiors, his, um, you know, the guys that you work with through your whole life and the guys that you look up to, when they're gone, I don't think MacArthur thought he had anybody that could tell him anything. You know, his mom's not like, you need to watch yourself, you know, with what you're doing or, you know, respecting any of these other people like that. But I think during the Pacific War, Halsey and Nimitz kept that in check and they kept MacArthur straight. Once they're gone, that's gone. And I think that's why you get to a lot of those problems in Korea. You know, Kruger's gone. You know, the guy who keeps in check with the army. Right. And those, those Navy paid. guys are gone. Right. Yeah. 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 And I, I, I think he just gets lost. He just needs their advice as well. He needs them mm -hmm. to straighten him out because you know, he doesn't see Truman or any of those people that way, you know or any of those okay. naval commanders. All right, well, you, you brought it up a couple times already, but why don't you talk to us about the uh, uh, Philippines-Formosa debate? Right. They, well, of course, we talked about the, the strategies they both have, and, and King wants to direct drive at Formosa, Taiwan, use that as a base for the invasion of Japan. MacArthur wants to go back to the Philippines, thinks that's the better route. Um, they'll finally come to Pearl Harbor to discuss this, and it'll be Nimitz and MacArthur and uh, President Roosevelt and Admiral Leahy. And Admiral Leahy will remark about how there was no rancor at all. These guys were total professionals. It, they were totally gentlemen. Um, the, the presentations that they put forth um, were what they thought, but both of them said, no matter what you decide, we'll work together. You know, it, it comes out that they go to the Philippines because they don't have the shipping. They would have had to stop the war in Europe. That's always the biggest problem for the Allies in World War II is shipping. Um, they wouldn't have had enough to get to Formosa. And they're able to pull this thing together. And, and you know, when MacArthur flies back to uh uh, Australia after that conference, he'll he'll say that Nimitz was just the the epitome of the essence of of fair play. You know that he was just a you know he was a top notch guy. And and you know I, I I think MacArthur gets wrapped up in his tirade sometimes, but I think deep down when he you know when he thinks about it, he he wouldn't want anyone else out there. You know, running running the navy. Right. 
So how does the Army-Navy rivalry in the Pacific play out in terms of the planning and preparation for the invasion of Japan? Well, that's that's the one, the big one where, you know, luckily that didn't have to go off. Um, but they're, you know, whereas you're using different things in different campaigns, they're going to use everything here. I mean, they're going in there like a steamroller and they're putting together all the operations. Um, first, they would hit Kyushu with Operation Olympic and then Coronet would hit Honshu uh, where Tokyo is. And right at the end of the war, in those early days in August, before they dropped the bomb, uh, Nimitz is, is pointing out to MacArthur that ultra code breaking is telling them that the Japanese still have about 6,000 planes. They're going to have a million people there in Kyushu. You know, maybe they need to um, not do this invasion. And MacArthur's like, I don't trust that ultra. We're going in there. We're going to take it. No problem. You know, and it's just a, it's a good thing the war ended. You know, because I, I think that would have would have would have really been a sticking point with MacArthur about going into um, Kyushu, because um, he's saying he didn't you know care about what the what the ultra was saying. Kind of like when you get back to the Admiralties, MacArthur always trusts his instincts more than than anything else. And so the the and we told you know we talked about those problems with you know getting the commands together. But once MacArthur and Nimitz get together and iron things out, then the staff you know, can pretty much do it. That's where it finally comes in, though, that the Navy's like, don't ever send Dick Sutherland back here to negotiate anything. That's MacArthur's <laughs> chief of staff, just because nobody could get along, you know, with him whatsoever. Um, but there it ends, you know, and and when uh, the Halsey and and Nimitz go back, MacArthur will say to both of them, it's a, it's a smaller world now, you know, with, with you guys gone. It's a it's not the Pacific anymore, you know, with you guys gone. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, inter-service rivalry has a, has a great deal to do with, with a lot of things, I think, early on. Um, definitely, you know, as, as they pull off the operations, though, um, it shows that they, they had a, a better understanding and a, an ability to cooperate in combined operations than, than any of their enemies did. And that's one of the main things that Kruger pushes for after the war um, is that we have to have the Navy, the Army, and the Air Force working together all the time to have this combined operation strategy for this atomic Cold War world. And it's no truer um, today than it was than it was then. Hmm. Right. And I think you brought it up earlier, but it wasn't just the Americans having these inter-service rivalries in the Pacific theater. I mean, the yeah. Japanese certainly have this and it's much more disruptive, I think, than what goes on between MacArthur and the other admirals. Well, that so. that's, I think that's the main reason why they, they lost it. I mean, you, you look at certain Japanese and Navy and Japanese army are working on radar capabilities and they're in one room and the army's in the other room and they don't talk, you know, they, we're not giving our secrets to you, you know, and, and that's kind of the, uh, what killed them, crushed them, you know. And I think it's interesting that uh, some of the propaganda coming out of, or you know, the Psy War stuff coming out of MacArthur's um, headquarters is, is basically trying to drive that wedge between the Japanese soldier and the Japanese sailor. Yeah, you know, because they clearly recognize during the war that there is this major inter-service rivalry, and that is something we can exploit. For and as well, benefit. those in those leaflets when they would, uh, Mac they would have MacArthur and Nimitz together on there with like the they've lassoed you know Japan or lassoed uh, the Philippines, you know, and how these two are the guys who are you know have walked all over you throughout the war, basically. Yeah. So. I, you know, but I think MacArthur, you know, just, he has respect for both of them. He knows their metal. Yeah. All right. Any final thoughts before we end? No, we'll be back with Korea soon, right? Yeah, we'll be talking about MacArthur and the U.S. Navy and the Marine Corps uh, in the Korean War in just Great. a couple of days. Great. Thanks, Amanda. No, oh, thank you.